Whether he's interacting with my two little girls and playing with them, or he's giving a public talk at a summit, he brings a, a quality of, of joy and laughter to what he does. And he's expressed, you know, in various times that sometimes he gets a little nervous being in the West and teaching in this context. And it's full of so much joy. Even the nervousness is just full of joy. And I, I truly aspire to uh, a meditative practice and to be a being uh, like Rinpoche who can find that quality of joy, that background of, of contentment uh, amidst all the different ranges of emotions and experience you can have. So uh, it has been such an honor to be with you, Sister Rinpoche. So thank you very much for being here with us. And uh, it's a true pleasure. So I, I wanted to begin, Rinpoche, by asking you um, if you could share a little bit about your biography. And you know, many of us in the West, our biography uh, starts uh, at birth in this life. But there's some interesting elements about your own story. And there are ways in which, um, at a young age, you actually recognize that your biography started before. So I would just anything you want to share, we just open the conversation with just telling us a little bit about you. And I'll also say, you know, with Rinpoche, one of the things that we've been talking about is that, you know, the differences between East and West. In the West, we're very individually oriented, and we like to know who the person is. We like to be able to feel them and know them. So we thought we'd start with this kind of question, but this is an unusual question that wouldn't normally be posed in, a, in an Eastern context. Or in so Rinpoche is very much experimenting here with all of <laughs> <laughs> Just let me hear about your biography and, and about Kudra Rinpoche. <laughs> uh, good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for uh, coming here and uh, being connected. And uh, I would like to say thank you, uh, Mikey, for introducing me to the olives. <laughs> so, I my legacy for many, many generations to come. There'll be a boom in Bhutan yeah. in the olive. <laughs> well, uh, so I'm asked to introduce myself, which uh, is more nervous things than me. <laughs> but uh, I try my best to, uh, you know, like put all the experience of 28 years old in this few minutes. Uh, but uh, the most important. Uh, of my uh, responsibility as the fifth uh, reincarnation of Kedukchun Rinpoche. I was born into a very poor family background where, uh, where they used to find so much difficult just to get these two ends. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, was born with the prophecy of that uh, my predecessor, so called fourth Kedukchun Rinpoche. He was a uh, very great as yogi, but I'm not. <laughs> so, sometimes I doubt whether I'm the true reincarnation. <laughs> but he has uh, two official wives, but I have no. no wife. <laughs> so that also led to success. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> so I was born and lived there. So I, you know, like sort of. Uh, Memories of my past lives were like a dream when I was almost like two, three years old. And I used to, I remember that I used to, to write on the neck of my grandmother and grandfather and pull the ears and like, you know, then like write them here and there saying, please take me to my monastery and cry. Mm -hmm. So um, those were my sort of like memories of uh, sort of like childhood. And uh, when I turned up five years old, then official recognition was done, and when I was 13, then I was officially uh, took to the monastery. So I was first introduced to the monastery's life when I was 13 years old. So until I was, I was 13, then I had the experience of being a cowboy. But it's not a fancy cowboy, it's like what you have in America. <laughs> we have a cowboy, man, this is the, uh, cowboy means that we have to isolate yourself into the jungles, where, I mean, like you won't even hear of the human so the like human speaking, you were only able to hear the birds singing. So and then also I have been uh, experiencing the life of even babysitter. Yeah. So probably I, I could become a good father. That was a good training. <laughs> so 
that way I was introduced to the monastery life. So uh, I was very fortunate uh, when my first master, uh, principal student of Southern Dinjayam uh, Bache, the great yogi, Kungzang uh, Namdurun Bache, he took care of me and uh, I was asked to go to a uh, retreat for three years when I was just young itself. And uh, so when, until I was 15, so 16, I was in the retreat as well as I was assisting him. So when I turned 16, so I joined uh, higher Buddhist studies in India for nine years and 2014, I got graduated in uh, Sutra and I, Tantra and teachings, which is today, they call it, it is equivalent to PhD, but I doubt, yeah. <laughs> so when I check myself in, in, in my sort of like brains, like whatever I have studied, I still find it all blank, <laughs> so not filled with anything. I think I could call myself that I'm unripe human being yet. <laughs> so, but till then, uh, I'm in front of a people who had great wisdom from you and who have this, uh, how to say, open heart. So, I am in the West not only to uh, teach, but also to learn and share our knowledge so that probably we can exchange our knowledge. So when I turned 19, then, um, then I was again given a big responsibility. That was my first uh, responsibility of my life, that I was appointed as the director of the, the monastery, which I'm living right now, uh, with 30 monks. That was quite a tough life. So sometimes I have to, because you know, in, in uh, Bhutanese way of like you know, monasteries, life is that uh, the head of the monastery is Responsible, responsible for all of their foods, lodging, and uh, uh, so education and everything. So education is quite little easy because you know, we have our friends who can go there and teach. But fooding and uh, lodging was very much difficult for me because mm -hmm. I have uh, come here from nowhere. Mm -hmm. Neither I know any persons like you all right now. If if I know people like today, probably. I could easily send some emails and saying that why not you help me? <laughs> but in those times, I myself was uh, a child, so so we have to. I, I have faced a lot, so much of difficulty. Sometimes I have to ask my monk to go in the midnight and steal someone's vegetables from someone's garden. <laughs> so, so, so even today I consider that uh, those kind of uh, experiences have built me a little stronger and then I feel like uh, uh, now I'm, I'm a little more mature than this, that time. So anyway, generally if I really wanted to, if I, if I describe my history or my biography, the responsibility of uh, our reincarnation is not something that we can really take it easily. But in the last few, past of a few years, sort of like, let's say, and then uh, in today's time also, many of the younger Rinpoches have been enjoying their luxurious life where they have lots of attendance, they drive luxury car, they live in a very nice house, they eat the foods that they wanted to eat. They are like a prince. But for me, it was sort of like a, how to say foundations. So I have never gone through that kind of luxurious life. I still wonder how does this luxurious life looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, still that eagerness is with me, but you know that eagerness is satisfied with olive spray. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, I sort of now related can related that probably that would be the great. The most beautiful luxury is like you know the test of all in mind. Mm. <laughs> so, so you have to describe the test of the olive, but it's beyond the uh, beyond than something that you could speak about. So, uh, you know, like if those who have uh, experience of this, uh, you know, practicing the dzogchen, then it's something beyond speechless. So the test of olive is also speechless. <laughs> so, I sometimes I could I want to refer to the dzogchen fruit. <laughs> so, so, As you can see, olives have had a big impact. <laughs> so, so that way, I would say that uh, my life was given this sensitivity. I still consider the reincarnation means like when you recognize and put on the throne to success your predecessors, you are given the biggest responsibility. 
So I was given the biggest responsibility. Kedupchen Rinpoches are the lineage holders of the Longchen Yingfi lineage in Bhutan. So after Gyawa Longchen Ramjan visited in 14th century in Bhutan, my first uh, reincarnation of Kedupchen Jimmy Kondur was a principal student of Jimmy, Jimmy Lingpa, the great Jimmy Lingpa. And then, you know, probably those who are familiar with these lineages might know about Jigme Lingpa had four principal students who are so-called uh, four throne holders of Long Chinese lineage. So one was a Bhutanese, so that was my first life. So since then, my predecessors have succeeded that throne and I'm, I'm the fifth reincarnated. So I have a responsibility of holding that lineage, spreading that lineage through teaching and through leading uh, uh, you know, like, uh, students to uh, to the practice. So <laughs> there is nothing, something very nice to hear about me, uh, which is something I mean, like you will feel a little more stress if I speak more. So anyway, but anyway, uh, I'm here to share something that, about the lineages and also, let's say, like being very openly, I'm very interested in technology. Mm -hmm. Well, the technology is one of the very thriving mm -hmm. developments in the world and today's time. Technology has made us very easy to connect. Probably here, yeah, like if someone is doing the uh, online sort of like recording, then uh, Bhutanese might be seeing in, in another world. From here, I think if you make a drill, so you can directly get to Bhutan. <laughs> so if anyone who who wants to innovate a speed train, then you can make a drill from here to Bhutan. <laughs> so another world, exactly. So they have 14 hours different. But till then, you know, the, this kind of uh, social media, so technologies have made us very connected. So in a way, social media is also uh, very dangerous. So my interest now in the West is to, how to say, practicing the ancient wisdom through technology and co-create the new skillfulness so that technology can be used as the skillfulness. So I'm coming up with this kind of uh, new sort of like, not exactly ideas, but uh, this is something that we are been always discussing till now. So anyway, this is my, uh, briefly, my life history. So, I think we're, we're running out of time. So, so. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So, I think um, one of the questions that I'd like to ask you that I think could be interesting for these folks is part of what you just started to speak about. And that is, you know, there are so many advancements that have happened in the West around technology. Yet, at the same time, there is sometimes considered a deficiency when it comes to internal development or wisdom development. And we have been the great beneficiary now of receiving some of these great lineages and great teachings. And I would be curious to know from you both um, what do you see as some of the gifts that the West has through technology and other things, and what could be the benefit? And also, what are some of the gifts that you feel like can come from Bhutan and from the Dzogchen lineage that perhaps could benefit us here in the West? That's a very good question, anyway. Uh, the, the greatest contribution towards the East from the West is not only a technology, it's the greatest wisdom that, you know, the very modern wisdom that the Westerners have. If you talk about, uh, uh, you know, like Orange, for example, uh, if we uh, talk in the Eastern sort of like people, and they will think this is just an orange. But here in the West, what they will do is, how does this orange goes out from all those things kind of like very, very deep of that orange, you will discover about it. And you will talk about again how to make this orange a little bigger or something. <laughs> 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 By innovating so many things inside. So that's why I think, uh, uh, you know, the creative, you know, mind, is actually more in the West. Mm -hmm. And through that, people also like, people are very, say, very free. I, I, I was sometimes, my, some of my teachers used to talk about the hippo culture. So hippo culture is living very free. 
Yeah. That is the story. Hippie. 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 Uh, uh, you know, when uh, one of our teachers from Yoshigami, Mr. Wendy, made his first visit in the West, he visited Las Vegas, right? <laughs> <laughs> Where everything has oh. to wear, I mean, like, naked yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how does it look like? <laughs> <laughs> We've been thinking about taking a of Las Vegas. Oh, <laughs> that, was, that was the greatest uh, drama then. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> when he came, we are a little bit sort of like reserved about this kind of things to become very free. But actually, we forget our originations. When we were born, we were never born with underwears. We came not all naked. But now, you know, we feel a little shy because now this kind of used to has been created in us. And when uh, Nushkin Rinpoche visited there, he still managed to wear some underwear and then almost like a few hundreds of people were looking at Rinpoche almost like he's only the naked person. <laughs> so, so then Rinpoche immediately, you know, like uh, looked himself back and then Rinpoche thought that these people are the real Dzogchen practitioners, <laughs> whereas they are really being natured. They still don't have any sort of shame or any kind of restriction or any kind of things to pull in or pull out. They're just being very natured. So this Dzogchen teaching is all about being natured, you know? being natural in a natural posture. So, uh, so Rinpoche took his underwear and left it so that everyone gives no damn at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I understand is that from this story is that Westerners are quite free. You know, like they are very free. They are very, how to say, eager to learn any new things. And that can manifest in the sort of new ideas for new methods for their life. So I think uh, the Eastern culture, uh, if it <coughs> comes to West, so then there are lots of like you know developments. For example, when you talk about mindfulness meditation, it actually comes from Eastern culture, you know, like few hundred thousands of years ago <coughs> now. So, but when it comes to the West now, how do you make? We make different kind of packages. <laughs> Where when people from Asia, when they have to come to attend this mindfulness meditation, they have to pay four thousand dollars. Everyone is shocking. <laughs> <laughs> so we said last year I was given, asked to uh, give a talk in uh, uh, something that uh, platform called Mountain Eagles, where riders from Asia they gather together and they share the knowledge. So I told them, if you don't take care of the Eastern culture properly. One day you have to pay four thousand dollars and learn from this yellow years. <laughs> so then only this how to say Bhutanese or Tibetans are getting almost like you know a little more shocked about because when they talk about money, then only then they're beginning to realize what precious things they have. Oh. So there are so many things. The West is actually contributing towards the East. So what we can get this uh, get from the East to West is that. Those precious things we can come bring here, then repackage and then sell back to East. <laughs> <laughs> so you have great economy. <laughs> so, so in a way, I'm also trying to bring one some portions of that to the West <laughs> to contribute this to the Westerners. So uh, the thing is, I'm not. This is little funny, but a fact is that Westerners know how to value that. Mm. How to value. That. It's not important about how much you have. It's about how do you have that? You know, how do you value that? How do you look into that? How precious is that? So I think this is what exchange that we need to do. Thank you. So you know, as I as I consider the great um, benefits that I've received through the meditation teachers that I've studied with. I can think about so many ways in which my life has improved, my emotional well-being has improved through meditation. Um, but I'd like to ask you, what do you see are some of the benefits that could come from some of these wisdom teachings that could come here to the West? What are some of the benefits that you experience from meditation and from some of these other teachings? I will try to speak the very important ones here.
anyone here who wants to suffer? <laughs> uh -huh. You can raise your hands up. Who wants to suffer? You want to suffer? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> anyone who wants to be happy? Can you please raise your hand? I think almost everyone, uh -huh. except in one. <laughs> <laughs> then you find your joy in suffering. It's like, uh, so, uh, meditation could be one technique, a very important technique, to innovate, uh, to bring a joyful or happiness that is undestructible, you put immortal happiness in yourself. There are lots of meditations, layers of meditations. In fact, uh, you can sometimes so call it, if you're mindfully driving, that is also our meditation, so that you you know, like you are safe from making an accident. If you're not mindfully driving, probably instead of having two legs, you will cut, you have to cut one another and have one fake, fake leg, right? When you have the accident and when someone crush your leg, what do you get? So meditation is immediately, if you really observe yourself, there are lots of benefits. The part, the sort of like relative Goal or the purpose of life is to, you know, accomplish the fruits of whatever you are focusing to do. For example, your job, your career, your family. What does this family break down? Is it? What is the reason? Because we are not there. Simply just being there, by, I mean, like into the same bed, in the same sofa, in one house, doesn't mean that you're together, your mind has to be there so that you can care of another person, so that you're fully there, so that your partner, each other can feel presence of each other. So when it is not there, so then you're beginning to get distracted. So then you'll begin to find all the negatives in, in each other. So that's where do you break down your sort of like family sort of relationships very easily. So even if you have to talk about having a good family, a good partner, you need meditation in there. It's fully being there. Charles. Meditation is not very important to sit down and close your eyes on all those things. Even like sometimes it, I feel like a little strange because I I my meditation technique is not always sitting. I, I sometimes walk, I talk, I, I look at the phone. So this different type of things, so I, I try. But when you get very used to in other things, this sitting is a little lazy and feeling more sleepy. <laughs> yeah. so, especially when you do a longer type of like meditation. I was one day uh, sitting uh, inside the cave actually. Uh, you know, I was doing meditations with uh, uh, and two of my friends, and then I didn't know that I was sleeping. I, I, until my friend heard that I was snoring. And like, I mean, no. <laughs> so, so meditation sometimes is sitting. It's not just simply that one. So you have a technical. If you have a technical meditation, so every way is meditation. So it will help you to accomplish your relative purpose. And if you really want it to be sort of like happy forever then this is something so-called intrinsic awareness, which is sort of the realization of intrinsic awareness, which is so-called enlightenment also sometimes. So that is called ultimate purpose of meditation. So meditation has lots of purpose. It will help you in a different way, you know, in order to make you happy. And even if you really wanted to suffer also, fully getting <laughs> suffer, <laughs> meditation can help you so many ways. <laughs> so I think that meditation from among the less, I think most important is this relative purpose and not purpose. Yes. So, so so we were we were having uh, dinner across the street at the Japanese restaurant, which is excellent if you have a question. And I asked Rinpoche, are there any questions that you would like to ask this group? So there's really a true learning and a dialogue. And he said he said, I'd be curious about what each person thinks is their relative purpose and their ultimate purpose, mm -hmm. how they would define that. Mm -hmm. so because this is one of the most central questions that we can ask ourselves. 
is to be, be clear about our motivation and to be clear about our own direction in life. So we thought we'd take just a few minutes for you guys to talk to each other and to just discuss for maybe it will take five minutes, so two minutes each. You guys are grown ups, you can determine uh, each person's time, but make sure both people share. But just find a partner and for five minutes, just articulate what do you feel like is your relative purpose and your ultimate purpose? And how would you define those? Okay, so we'll take five minutes. Please have a conversation. We'll bring you back in five minutes. Gosh, it's so good to feel all of the energy in the room, all of the excitement. So we'd like to harvest a bit about what you spoke about. And, you know, Rinpoche wanted to ask this question because he's genuinely curious. He really wanted to know. So we'd like to just hear from a few people. Uh, how did you respond to that question? You can either respond for yourself or for your partner, whatever feels I hadn't heard um, those two terms before, relative and ultimate purpose, but my partner um, helped me. And, they, and just hearing the terms opened up a new category for me. And I experienced them as being very, um, very similar um, about um, it's both the path that I consciously walk day to day and it, and if I and to look at the ultimate purpose, I just feel very very married. It's about bringing attention um, to fully incarnating, to not to transcendence, but to exquisite full um, embodied presence. Mm -hmm. So that and I would say it both for relative and ultimate as a, as. So the ultimate purpose, perhaps, uh, the question is, why did the universe come appear in this way? What did what did nature uh, want of us? But why did it create us? And in that sense, there's this sense of the unborn, which is uncreated, that seems to be reuniting everything that is created and recreated again and again in that reflection way, which is the relative. And the relative purpose uh, is to for, to serve this awakening to our ultimate purpose. So we had a common theme in our definition of the ultimate versus the relative purpose. And the theme seems to be uh, the, the relationship between with each other, so the dependency we all have on each other, and then uh, the individual. So it seems that the common, uh, you know, theme is that you want to. The ultimate goal is to love yourself, and the relative goal is to love others. And you know, you can inverse that. I'm sure at certain times in your life you may experience uh, loving everybody before yourself, and, and so that's I think in many ways. How you frame that in your mind is actually how you have to see and change the game. We have one more person. Share a bit about the show. Um, one of the ways that I understand relative purpose is um, maybe more conventionally that, that there are many roles to play, and I think in any collection of people, uh, you have different personalities and talents and dispositions, and they can really complement each other. And I, I think, so it, it, perhaps at an ultimate level, there's a kind of oneness, and there's something that, uh, there are those boundaries don't really exist, but I think in the relative uh, realm, it's about coming to know myself, like what are the unique uh, qualities, skills, 
awarenesses that I bring to the people around me and knowing what those are and really expressing them fully and bringing that into the people that I interact with and, and, and sort of taking on a role in society that uh, fits into the whole and, and supports people in a way that is sort of unique to what I can do. Thank you for sharing. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing, every one of you. Yeah, this is a very rich uh, question. So I was thankful, thankful to you, Ramsha, that you posed it. I wanted to learn. And one of the things that, that we've talked about with regard to both relative purpose and ultimate purpose, and in particular the role of meditation, is that um, many people in the West are very interested in meditation, but they're not always as interested in the motivation for meditation. And uh, I was wondering if you could speak a bit about motivation and uh, maybe even its relationship to ultimate purpose or relative purpose. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> again, this funny guy is going to speak. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is also one of the very important uh, uh, what's the like, uh, point that we really need to know about is that uh, when we talk about this ultimate purpose, then probably at that time this motivation is no more needed. But uh, when you, how to say, grow yourself with certain meditations or anything, I think motivation is very important. It is, how to say, inseparable uh, with meditations. Motivation is... Uh, the way that you know you think about for example you know when you talk about the anger then uh, what does this meditation does is that immediately when someone makes you angry then you are trying to resist that block that how to say this is blocking right block that and that trying to be patient so yeah you forget them you forget to get angry after that because you your meditation power, the power of meditation, have pressed this anger downside. But one day, this anger will come again. So it's very important to ask that, what does this anger does? Where does this anger come from? How does it transform? What is the benefit of this anger? It is to ask to yourself, and you have to ask to the things that makes you angry. For example, if someone has broken your phone, which is very important, right? <laughs> yeah, which is, I think, very important. In, in, in the West, I think, if you don't have a phone, then you have no job. <laughs> when you have to drive, the navigation is phone. <laughs> yeah, when you have to text your girlfriend or boyfriend, then their phone is needed there. You cannot just say, hello, are you there? <laughs> no one can hear that, right? So phone is one of the very biggest figure. But what? And why do you have to get angry because someone has broken your phone? Actually, the anger will just come and react because you are very used to getting angry. Anger is one of the biggest friend or long-lasting friend that you have been friendship <laughs> with till now. So whenever there is something comes up, your anger will always try to come and defend you. You know, saying that, I will deal with this. And once you show all the anger, then anger will say, I don't know, now you deal it. <laughs> so you have broken your friendship with another person, or you have lost your job already. So anger will say, now I don't know, it's your mistake. <laughs> so this is what anger does with us, actually. It's a bad friend. <laughs> so what do you have to do now? If you can fix this phone, why don't you just fix it instead of getting angry? What makes you? When you get angry, does this phone join itself? <laughs> and then immediately uh, just say sorry by the phone? No way, right? There is no way. But if you cannot fix this phone, what was the usage? What was the purpose of getting angry again? It cannot be fixable. So see, like anger is coming all of the all of a sudden in of no use then. So now when you really analyze, so that's where you find the purpose of motivation. 
So if you have this motivation in you, that will change the way of thinking. So if you have a, if you create this motivation power more and more, no matter in your society, 99% of people look backward on you, you know, and then you have left all single, you will still find one reason to be happy yourself. And you will still manage to smile. <laughs> so that's very beautiful, isn't it? It's one of smile. Oh my goodness. Do you have to buy it from the market for that? Yeah. You just don't need to do it. I mean, you don't need to expend lots of money to make you smile. So happiness has to grow within yourself. So motivation is one way or very sort of like the way that, that can, how to say, like crush your negative emotions permanently. So the, on top of this motivation, if you do the meditations, so meditation will stabilize that sort of like behaviors or character in you. So that whatever happens, no matter what different kind of one, what big, what small, that things related to that anger, if it comes again and again, you will have no them afterwards. So that's how you have to, uh, how to say, create this motivation power more and more. So motivation is one of the most important. So do not forget that the meditation is only the very powerful thing. That the things that meditation makes powerful is actually motivation. So it is unseparable. So don't break the chain. So I think this is that much powerful. It's equal as meditation. So does it make clear? Uh -huh. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. Means yes or no? <laughs> yeah. So you have to do yes. <laughs> this is Indian way of doing. It's very neutral, you know. Indians, what they they will. Is, is there any Indians here? Uh, you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, Indians are very flexible. If they say, "Are you okay?" Yes. Uh, are you okay? No. <laughs> are you okay? I don't know. <laughs> so it's all neutral sign. So. This one means probably yes, no, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, this, this kind of cultural insight is so great because when, when Rinpoche was over for Thanksgiving, I didn't realize that you know, there's so many things that he hasn't been exposed to and vice versa, so many things we haven't been exposed to in Bhutanese culture. But it was, we were at Thanksgiving dinner and dinner had just finished. And I said, Rinpoche, would you like a piece of pie? It's, a, it's an American tradition. And he said, what is pie? You know, so I just, I sometimes am, am so impressed by the ways in which Rinpoche is showing up and being flexible and learning and just so incredibly open-minded. So, so when you say, uh-huh, he, he, he learns. That means, yes, we agree. Probably this could be, a, uh, I mean, like, I have a good example for you people. Uh, day before yesterday, I was talking with Connie, uh, my organizer, and then I was asking about uh, today's program, and then, and she was keep talking. I just say, mm hmm. And then she said, keep talking. Because for me, mm hmm means I don't know. You have to. <laughs> so, this is, this is the language I'm trying to install in me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, when I asked Rinpoche about what, what he thought would be the best thing to teach about, so I think most of you know, but we're teaching a day long retreat tomorrow here. And, um, I said, Rinpoche, what would you like to teach about? What should we share about with this community here? And he said, motivation. Motivation is the most important thing that we can start teaching about. Motivation and meditation, right, as a link. But not just one without the other. So I hope some of you can join us tomorrow and so we can go into that more fully. So Rinpoche, when we, you first met Mikey in Mexico. Where's Mikey? I remember when Mikey came back, Mikey said, I met this amazing Rinpoche. He's interested in technology, and he's like, I really think he can be an incredible partner. And, and um, we both got excited, and we have a, the reason you're here is because so many people got so excited. So I, I wanted to ask you, Rinpoche, what, uh, what really excites you about coming to the West? And what are some of the reasons? Why do you want to come here? Well, uh, I have many reasons to come to the West, to be honest. But uh, I would say I was very excited to come to the West. I applied for almost three, four times, I got rejected. So, you know, like I was not granted. And then last time that when I applied for American visa, then the application was accepted and I went for interview and I gave an interview and then the, the, the interview guy said like, sir, you are not qualified to go to United States. <laughs> so, so I 
No, that means it was not rude for me. It was good for me. You know, it gives me the chance to improve myself. For him, if I'm not sort of qualified, then yes, what is qualified mean? Qualification means that means I have to practice more. <laughs> so I have to become more little, sort of like more wiser, you know, like so then I can, then only I can able to f- fit in American shoes. So <laughs> right or wrong? So uh, well, that this time I totally depend on my previous karmic connection. So if I'm destined to go to United States and able to inspire people here and able to inspire myself, if I could able to exchange these knowledges, then I will totally get this visa. So it happened. So I'm here. Uh, before I met Mikey in uh, Mexico, I used to blame the technologists a lot because technology for every purpose, let's say, including myself, you know, this habit has been created very early morning, you know, like when you just wake up instead of, because, you know, Rinpoche, can you even think Rinpoche don't meditate? <laughs> it's a little crazy, right? You know, but what I happened was actually last few years, a few years ago from now, even I was not graduated, this sort of like habit was created with me because technology is very easy to get sort of diluted. So every morning when, once I just opened my eyes, looking at phone, I was watching like in the Facebook that what my friend said. <laughs> yesterday, sort of like yesterday, I uploaded one picture. I was just going through the comments. If someone says like, are you handsome or not? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's updates. And if, uh, if someone says, you look so ugly, like piggy boy, and immediately my mood is off. So whole day, I'm a little grumpy. You know, you know, sort of like angry bad face. I, I, you know, I can say that. But, but if someone says, like, you know, you are very handsome, then you are so hyper. Like, you know, you, you, you feel like jumping, like, say, yes, I have got all those. Almost like, you know, you have got this, uh, Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> sort of like that. So, you know, like, every day that I was getting more deluded by sort of, uh, technologies, then I can feel that my brain was been disturbed a lot. So it is easily getting disturbed, disturbed by anything else. So then later, I slowly keep these technologies away. And then I find the Bhutanese youths, especially the young age people, who are also getting depressions a lot. So I used to blame my technology a lot in that time. And then the very interesting thing happened, the Catherine also knows that, she is also there, <laughs> you know. Well, that's what that, uh, we were invited by this very interesting guy called Louis, uh, to attend this World Happiness Feast in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. Beautiful place. I eat lots of tacos there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. And then I met this uh, very interesting guy. Uh, sometimes I call it this technological Buddha uh, to Mikey. There was sort of like group flow that I was sort of little uh, curious about and he explained a little bit about uh, the, you know, this technology where people have to have this EG, right? EG, and then when they meditate together, it's a group flow. It means like it's, it's a, it's the energies of gathering. So when every one of them has a good concentration, then it can create some sort of sounds. Then I begin to have something hopes. Oh, there is one way to revive or rejuvenate this system through technology. Because if you asked anyone not to have fun over here, will you, are you ready to take my advice? <laughs> you, only one, see, <laughs> only one. Rest of others, let's say, if you want to write something on letter, you need computer. If you wanted to call someone else, you need phone. So technology is sort of like very necessary things in modern world. So, but you know, in order to let technology ruin the beauty or of the shaping the world into different, I mean, wrong way, so why not we work together with technologies so that, you know, wisdom can inf- infuse with, sort of like, technology can infuse with uh, wisdom so that becomes sort of like good way for people. So I think, uh, you know, we have to really come up and stay together, sit together, talk about you know, how these technologies can infuse with uh, this ancient traditional wisdoms. 
so that can inspire each and every day of your people. So one day, like probably if you are, I was one day, last time I was with uh, Michael Tuft in, uh, where was that? Uh, huh? Yeah, Union Square. So we were just going there in uh, one sort of like meditation apps maker, that kind of company. So I was talking to them like, why not this, uh, how to say, like, when you drive the car, I think nowadays there are lots of sensors, but I didn't knew that one. But I said, like, in a car, there are lots of crush, because, you know, most probably you are very greedy, because you are running out of time, then you have to put on a speed, then you lost your uh, sort of, like, uh, control, then you crush the car, you die. And also in a way that you drive with anger a lot, and so you don't even know, like, you're driving more than hundreds, and you crush the car, you die. So I was, I was, I was recommending some of them, like, why don't you make some sort of like software so that that can have a sensor that you, the car knows that you are getting angry and then immediately giving you advice. So they said like, oh, that would be a good idea, but challenging, all those things comes up. <laughs> but anyway, you know, these days people learn more from technologies than, than from human beings. What do you do right now if you lost your way or if you wanted to know about Bhutan? Just go to the Google. I call it Google Guru, actually. You know, like, Google. Just, yeah, Google Guru. So everything, Google knows everything. And just immediately type about things and then comes up. One very wonderful thing is like, now it is Siri, you know. Hey Siri, call Mikey. And like, <laughs> so immediately it's beginning to call. And there was, what, what was, Alexa. Your house? Alexa, play some Bhutanese mantra. Immediately, it's, what is the world happening? It has made you very, sort of like, very lazy, sort of like. If I have all those excuses, probably I will be the most laziest person in the world. <laughs> but anyway, you know, there is so many ways that we can, because we humans are the one who create this technology. So when you create this technology, if you have good intentions in it, then probably this can manifest into the good things. For example, if you make foods with love and care and with anger, then probably when you cook the foods with anger, probably half of this food is burnt. So when you eat food, then little smelly of smokes, all those things will come up, over roasted. But if you cook with love, then you know the limit of like you know how how much it has to be cooked out. So it is different, you know. There is a difference. Even cooking the food itself comes different. So why not this technology? So my interest has a lot of sort of like, you know, it, it will come to serve lots of purpose in my life. The, the biggest thing is actually to work with technology. I am really interested, but I, I don't know how, how to play with it. I still don't know how to use series in my phone. Uh, I tried, but it felt sometimes because of, I think I'm, I'm mispronouncing the words. So I tried once, like, because I saw the Mikey was doing the, hey Siri, call someone and calls. I tried, like, you know, hey, call my father. But then like, father is not exist or something. <laughs> of course, I know my father's phone number is there, <laughs> but still doesn't listen to me. <laughs> so, so it doesn't matter whether I know it or not, but it's very important to bring this sort of like, uh, how to say, technologist, scientist, psychologist, everything, and spirituals come together. And why don't we create this uh, shape of the world a little better so that your future generations are safe. So they can still see, you know, like how does this uh, uh, original of world is exist about. If not, if it happens like today, everyone will create item bomb, they will throw there and all, 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 all the things will happen. And then the advantage of uh, technology is there, but there are lots of disadvantage also. So it will not take much enough times for mafias to kill another person. <laughs> Probably you will feel like you are bited by a uh, mosquito, but you already got a poison. Mm -hmm. This could be also happen. So in, in different way, if you really think about some disadvantaged way, it is really risky. The world is going through so much of, I mean, like of difficulties time now. So we have to rejuvenate that system through the technology. So that's my biggest interest of coming to the West. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so Rimshe, in that in that vein, one of the things that we've talked about are that there are two different uh, entities or organizations that you'd like to establish, and 
One of them you call International Buddhist Academy, and one of them you call Haruka House. And I'm wondering if you could say a bit about these two groups and relationship, perhaps even to technology and your larger mission. Probably you all won't call me a, a man with a lots of desires. <laughs> well, I mentioned earlier that I'm a responsible man. So my responsibility, the Rinpoche, is, it is actually referred to the precious man. But I am, I am nothing precious. My eyes is not precious. My nose is not yet precious. Nothing is precious here. Almost my nose looks bigger size than yours. That's much. So, <laughs> so uh, some of my uh, friends in Bhutan, very close ones, call me a pumpkin. Do I look like pumpkin? <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, especially when I wear these orange things. They really, uh, I, I assume like probably, uh, when, sometimes when I think and you know, of myself and I'm remembering of how do I look like inside the mirror. Sometimes I really look like pumpkin. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this body is not precious. Rinpoche is not referred to this physical form. But uh, Rinpoche is referred to that responsibility that's given to me. So I have to serve this uh, responsibility. I have to really manifest these responsibilities. So these two important uh, how do you say, organizations, is actually one of the very important projects of my foundation, Kedu Foundation. So, the importance of these two institutes is that, uh, you know, International Buddhist Academy. So for now, uh, how many of you have been to India and Nepal? And Nepal. India, how much of you have been? How much of you have been to Tibet? Oh, few. I think one or two. Not bad, not bad. How, many, how much of you have been to Bhutan? Oh, great. At least two, not bad, yeah. So, uh, um, yeah. How much of you have been to China? Oh, many, see? So, see, like, you know, you probably uh, must have been nearby monasteries, yeah? In Nepal, China, Tibet, Bhutan, India, Thailand, yeah? Thailand, definitely. See, like, the question is that, if you ask for the rooms inside the monastery, then probably they will give you a room to stay there for two or three nights. But if you ask to give the permissions to study there, then first question they will ask is shave your hair. <laughs> Anyone who loves this hair to keep longer, which looks more beautiful, doesn't want it to shave, right? It's actually your signal, your sign. You respect your physical form. So this International Buddhist Academy is actually going to be happening in Bhutan. This will be the first monastery that the door of the monastery is open for every kind of international people. You don't need to shave your hair. You don't need to wear monk's robes. You can come even naked. I will just allow you. You can think that is a second Las Vegas. It's still okay. <laughs> Probably that could be very good demonstration for my monks. <laughs> How does it look like? <laughs> Every detail of human beings, so that they can never to see. So, <laughs> so, but the purpose is actually not to make these accessible things in the, in the monasteries. But this, the purpose that it is serve is that we are designing the curriculums, everything, not just simply in ancient. Himalayan language, we so call it Chuke or Dharma language. And also something, some people, they also claim it's Tibetan language. Yes, it is Tibetan, ancient Tibetan, but it is not actually Tibetan. It's an ancient uh, Himalayan language that's called Chuke. So not only in Chuke, we will also, we are also designing the curriculums in English. So to who wanted to go for the deeper understandings of, of what is the Buddhist teachings are about. So these people can come and learn there. So we are designing curriculums up to nine years. So, but if someone who doesn't have a time, instead of, you know, uh, going for the holidays in Bangkok, investing lots of money near, near, uh, I think, uh, Phuket and, well, what's that? Yeah? Mm -hmm. a Pattaya. Yeah. You know, see? So why not you come to Bhutan to learn? This will be meaningful holiday. Many people come, let's say, 
they pay $250 and around the Bhutans to see the monasteries, see the sites. But what's there? You only carry, carry the memories in the photos. And when they come here, after one year, after two years, until unless someone asks you, how is Bhutan? <laughs> then you will not even remember that. So, oh, Bhutan was beautiful after two years. A slight memories you have. But if you understand, if you, if you study that, then this will inspire your sort of like rest of your life. Probably, relatively, it could make you a good human being, a good husband in your house, a good wife in the house, a good daughter, a good son, you know, a good leader of the office. So anything you want to look for the perfectness, I think that's a, something that you have to learn through. So this is actually what's going to be in National Buddhist Academy. I'm just, there are lots of ways to describe, but the most interesting way I think that uh, you all will find is that one. And Heruka House here is actually, this is, uh, this is a newborn sort of like ideas once I have come to United States actually. What we can do is that actually people over here are very, very into, I mean like, they're seekers, they're hungry. They are really thirsty of like, you know, what will make them more sort of like successful, more peaceful, how they can contribute to the society. That's a good sign. So what I'm trying to do is that actually the technology, the basis in technology or something that the Western, uh, how to say, what was the word, Mikey? West, Western psychology, right? Yeah, Western psychology. Western psychology and uh, Eastern sort of like you know spiritual uh, sort of wisdoms that can combine together uh, that can sort of like how do you say you can say better than me. No, you're doing great. Uh, I really, can if you want. Really, really. Of course. Uh, what was that? Now I don't remember the yeah, word. Yeah, yeah. Can you help me? Can you help me innovate. say that? Innovate. Yes, mm -hmm. that can innovate with uh, a new sort of like co-create co a new skillful means and through technologies. So that can serve the purpose of both, you know, these two purposes. They can go for meditations with sort of like uh, technology. For example, we talk about Bardo teachings. Anyone who is familiar to Bardo? How many of you? Bardo teachings? Yeah, I think few. Few of you knows, but probably you can share later on, please. Yeah, uh, between the death and the life. So. The Bardo teachings, you know, usually we teach from the books, but if you have this virtual reality in it, it will look much more better, I think, you know, instead of just simply. So people will also still understand better way, I think, you know, it makes a lot. It can make a big changes, actually. So why not we bring this kind of things inside? Technology. There are lots of access in technology. We cannot just simply saying, hey, this has to be very secret inside the books. Still, the teaching is teaching. Whether you teach from computer, whether you teach from books, whether you teach through the virtual, virtual reality, almost it serves the same purpose. Even like virtual reality would be much better. So, Heruka House is actually the innovation of, uh, you know, of technology as a skillful means and uh, this combination of Western psychology, uh, psychology and uh, Eastern sort of like uh, how's ancient wisdom is uh, wisdom so that uh, that infuse, how to say? It, yeah, they're, yeah. They're integrated together. I am lost now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it, it is sort of like, you know, that kind of center so that it will uh, serve the, in better way for the Westerners anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's how this Heruka house is going to be look like. Actually, uh, Mikey and Dustin will explain a little better than me, actually. But I have, because I was been, you know, installing these things in their brain for quite a long time. <laughs> so, uh, they, if they, if they speak, can you please, I ask you to share a little more so that they I can get, yeah, they can get, right? yeah. they can yeah, get, you're very clear. oh, really? Yeah. Oh, then do I deserve one clip? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. It was great. I feel like superstar now. <laughs> so, so one of the things that, that we promised all of you and that Rinpoche and I talked about was that tonight wouldn't only be speaking and talking, but we'd also do a little practice today. 
And um, uh, Rimshay asked if I would lead a little bit of meditation. Yes, but, yes. but before I do that, I'd like to just speak, have, ask you one more question. And that said, if you could speak a little bit about uh, shine, or calming, staying practice, and then I'll guide everybody through a short meditation together. Yes, uh, well, uh, I'm sure that many of you are familiar about meditation, so each and every, I think, better than me also. But shine means the calm abiding, which is fundamental uh, of the meditation, a foundation of meditation, actually. This is where the rest of other meditations grows out from. Shine means being calm, you know, being calm. And being calm means actually it's bringing your soul back to your home. Home, your body. It's basically your home. Your, your, your mind is not, not inside the home. It is always wandering around. We call it monkey mind. You know, it is always, you're just trying to be mindful for just one minute. And after second minute, it will say, oh, I left my purse in my car. What would I do? Probably, uh, why in case, you know, like if you have secret girlfriends, then you left your phone near by your wife's bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness, what if someone, if, if my girlfriend texts my, uh, me and then my wife has seen that one? <laughs> the second thing is that. So see, like your mind is always tickling you in a way. So it is not letting you to be yourself. It will always snatch you in some way. So shine is basically, even like when you sort of like focus on breathing, movement of your mind, of any kind of thing actually, that is called, that is some sort of like uh, basic shine, sort of like it's a one of methods of obtaining this calm abiding meditation. So actually the, in the shine we have nine different sort of like perspectives of, of shine, but I think uh, we should, we, we don't need to share that one, but probably when we have time next time we can always come together and share that again. So, but shine means something that is totally concentrated. Probably we can also call it as concentration for the shine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. So that's shine. Did you understand what is shine? Yes. Yeah. I think I'm trying to speak it a little uh, into the more easier way of understanding, by the way, so that you can understand. Yeah. So in Shine, so call it that, in Sanskrit we call it Shamatha, right? Shamatha. From the Shamatha, then Vipassana, so call it Laktong. In, in, in Tibetan, so call it Laktong will be grown from that. Once you have this stable foundation, then, you know, like when you have stable form, wherever it is, Shine is like, you know, creating the new sort of platforms for where you can grow this beautiful sort of like vegetables. You know, you cannot grow the vegetables on the stone, do you? <laughs> yeah, um, I think naked stone, you cannot grow vegetables, but you have to, you have to create this beautiful farm. So that where you put all of those, how to say, fertilizers, you have waters, you have a sunlight, so that you can grow a beautiful vegetables, you know, very nourishing one. So as if like the shine is the foundation of the laktong, so-called vipassana. And on top of that, if you talk about Dzogchen, then you have the structure, tegel, vessel, and oh my goodness, mind-blowing ones is up there. But it's very important to have the foundation. Otherwise, if you don't have a foundation, then almost it is like a, here you are trying to build one house with only one pillar, and here you are trying to make maybe like nine or ten different stories of a house. It's, it's not stable. It will break down. So you have to create this shine very stable. You know. You have to, your foundation has to be stable. So that's what she is. Yeah. Great. Thank you for um, Just before we start, let's stand up for a moment just so we can change the energy up a little bit. Nira. Okay, so if you're sitting in a chair, please sit on the front of your chair so that you can have your feet flat on the ground and your back can be straight. If you're sitting on a cushion. Ideally, your hips are higher than your knee. If that's not possible, the main point would be make sure that your spine is straight. And for this first meditation, you can use your eyes closed or eyes open. Whatever you're more used to is okay. So there are seven basic points of posture. Rather than going through all seven, I'll just give you two simple points that come from Trunk Rinpoche. He says, allow your spine to be straight. 
And the straight spine represents fearlessness. And allow the front of your body to be soft and gentle. So the meditation posture is a combination of fearlessness and gentleness. And then just notice the fact that you're breathing. It takes no effort to breathe. You don't need to change or manipulate your breath. Just allow your breath to be natural. And then direct your attention onto your breath like you're steering a car onto a road. And your task is to stay with each inhale and each exhale. It's perfectly okay if you get distracted. Use your intelligence to notice distraction quickly and direct your attention right back to your inhale and exhale. Just as Rinpoche was saying, when you bring your mind back to your breath, you're bringing your mind back home. If you're distracted, it's perfectly okay. Come right back to your breath.
<clears throat> and then just take a deep inhale into your belly. And exhale out fully. You can bring the meditation to a close and stretch out your body. So one of the other things that I wanted to make sure we have time for tonight is to ask Rinpoche some questions and to see if there are any questions in the audience that are alive for you. Um, if there aren't any, we can come back and we can do a second round of meditation. But I wanted to make sure we left space for everybody. So are there any burning questions? Are there any, anything that you'd like to ask Rinpoche? Okay. I'd like to know, what was your experience um, knowing that you had past lives? What were some of the images you had and how did you feel when you first knew that you had had past lives? Oh, exciting. Mm. <laughs> um, very honestly, I still sometimes go back to my but I'm 28 years, years old, so I still become very naughty sometimes. But, yeah? Very naughty? I mean, like, what kind of naughty I can be? <laughs> <laughs> very much. No one can even imagine that. <laughs> well, anyway, I become like a puppy. Puppy, right? Puppy. Huh? Yeah. Anyway, uh, the experience was that uh, I cannot really remember properly because it was quite a long time back. It was like, you know, I have never been felt myself as a little child, yeah. Uh, I used to have two brothers that, you know, whenever, like, you know, I used to sometimes run away and uh, isolate myself in the caves. And uh, I remember that my, my mother's grandfather, which is my great-great-grandfather, was also in Buchi, like, me. and then uh, he has this religious instruments kept locked inside the box, which is very secretly kept. And then whenever my grandmother goes to the field to work, and I was probably three, four, or three, four years old, I used to always unlock that things and bring up and beat all those things. So my, my grandmother would, you know, like, you know, rushly come and then almost like you know one time I remember like I was doing that and she what the punishment she gave me was it was in the winter we have a snow so what she did was she took uh, the bucket full of cold water and poured me on my head and then she didn't let me to change my clothes so uh, those kind of things you know very how to say naughty but uh, sort of uh, very how to say curious, e curious naughty which not something about uh, you know playing with toys. I have never played with toys, being honest. In my lifetime, uh, I would say one thing: I have never been to play uh, playground, so to play football. So I used to always consider uh, that when my elders today, I think you know people even serve. I mean, like uh, make their life with playing footballs. Yeah. So those times I used to think that playing is little. Ch children's game. <laughs> I never used to think it is a mature people's game. But uh, now I think I should learn now. I probably, I would know that if the ball will kick me or I will kick the ball. So uh, still nervous, you know, I, I really don't know this culture about. So uh, experience was that uh, never something as a kid. And uh, sometimes I like, used to recall those memories of uh, uh, being with some people, you know, then uh, I remember that when one time that uh, there was a, a very close, to, uh, you know, like friends of my previous lives, they come across nearby my uh, my house, and then I called them, and then I talked to them, and they were quite shocked, like, you know, this little kid talking almost like a grandfather. <laughs> yeah, they were like white beard and uh, like old sticks and all those. So they were quite shocked also sometimes. So experience of uh, being in that memory life was sort of like that. It was sort of uh, things that sometimes it used to click in me, in me, like a dream, you know. That was only like that. So nothing more special. Probably we all have that one. There's nothing special, to be honest. I think every one of you, sometimes it might be like clicking in you also. 
if when you meet with some people, probably you might be thinking, I know this person for a long time. That kind of feelings are there. Sometimes when you arrived in new places, so you feel like you know that person is familiar for you. So somehow this could be connected from your past also, or something that could be f coming in the future also. So uh, that kind of things ever happens with everyone else, I think. The only difference that uh, you and me might be that I used to recollect everything when I was young, probably that is the only the thing. Yeah. Uh, one time it happens was that uh, the meditation caves of my previous life was hidden. No one knows that one. They, it was it was a sort of like, how do you say, in, in uh, sort of like cultural of Tibetan cultures, there is hidden treasures, you know, you hide inside. It is in the middle of the village, yet no one knows that. one. So he used to go there and then do the meditation. And people know that it's somewhere there, but they don't know where is that actually. So what happened was one time I was invited nearby that cave for a big ceremony to perform and then I was... Uh, I was, I had to lead that ceremony. And in the middle of the ceremony, sort of like a, a type of like, I was half asleep, then I used to recollect these dreams, you know, being around this cave. So I asked that uh, one of the uh, very oldest people over there, she was almost 89 years old. And she has been living in, in around that place for almost when she was at least 10 years old. And she, her whole lifetime, almost 79 years old, was lived around there. And then I asked her, do you have a cave around here? So she says, no, we don't have cave, any caves. So I said, yeah, no, there is a cave. <laughs> so she said, no, there is no cave. So we bet, actually. You know, I, I said, yes, there is a cave. And she said, no, there is no cave. So anyway, but there, I think I was also in doubt. Uh, otherwise, I would have bet little, almost a few thousands of, 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 of money, so, so <laughs> if I'm confirmed. So in doubt, anyway, I said, yes, and she said, no. So. I lead uh, almost 45 of people, so we went around and then a little bit, little bit sort of like you know, clicking in, so we make this round and we found the caves inside, inside the earth. So we discovered this big cave, almost like, you know, still there was a sort of like very beautiful seat of my previous life, who has been sitting and meditating there. So we seated all there. Everyone there, mama cried and they, then this old grandmother recollects the memory saying that, your previous life used to go around these places and meditate, and but we never knew this was here. Mm -hmm. And then it is just on my, like, let's say, like 35 steps away than her own home, so that people still don't know. So, these kind of things were my memories, my past lives. So anyway, this is also illusions, by the way, very relative. <laughs> don't take it serious, don't take it serious, by the way. I'm not uh, asking you to practice to remember all those things. If you remember all, then you will become very emotional. There's no use afterwards. <laughs> so be uh, present right now. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, I want to ask a relative question and an ultimate question. Uh, relative, where did you learn your English? Did you learn that in Bhutan? Because you speak very good English. And then the other ultimate question is, is you talked about taking a three-year retreat when you were young, at 13 or something. Was that a three-year silent retreat? Um... Okay, relative question. Uh, there is nothing to get shocked about, but I have never gone to formal English schools. My English is self-taught. So that's why I, I find lots of challenges and, and uh, you know, like bringing up this really technical uh, words, which is really ethical, uh, how to say, and all those things. I still don't know. So I speak very simple English, language, that's why. So, so speaks 13 languages, just uh, <laughs> But, you know, English, English I, I, I consider it's very important one, so that's why I'm trying to speak. I'm trying to learn. Whenever you people speak a very new sort of like word, I'm trying to grab that one and then tr immediately go into my technologies, like my phones, and which I have one uh, translated in my language, Tibetan language and English, so that I'm trying to type it, so it says something, okay, this is that. But I forget again. <laughs> so I have to get used to it again and again to doing that. But uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for, because you know, this is all about because of foreigners. I often meet with new friends. They teach me English. I teach them Dharma. So this is the way that we exchange. 
And uh, your ultimate goal, it is also a relative question, by the way. Anyway, thank you so much. It was, uh, I was actually asked to go for three years retreat by my master. Um, but uh, when he tried, uh, when I stayed almost uh, two and a half years of the retreat, then uh, it was one year, exactly one year after he, was, he, ex he died. So he knew that he's dying, so that was not really a good place for me. So I was take, taken out from the retreat. It was silent retreat also. Yeah. But silent means like three months silent, three months speaking, because I have to talk to him and get all the instructions. And three months were silent, and it was off and on. So anyway, two and a half years, sort of like I have stayed in the retreat. And then uh, when he knew that he's dying, I didn't actually, I didn't knew that. He is going to die. So he sent me for higher Buddhist studies. And the next year, he said, you know, I came and visited him and said, uh, paid the visit to my master. He said, this is going to be our final meeting. I was thinking like, oh, uh, he will live longer anyway. But yeah, after uh, three or four months, then he, he died. So that was a very tragic, tragic moment for me. I lost my spiritual father which was uh, everything for me. He was not just only my spiritual father, but he serves me in different roles. Even right now, what I am right now, it's all about his blessing. I consider that. He used to often say, whenever you go and uh, you know, like speak to people, probably he used to mention even the West also, those times. Uh, I didn't even realize that I would be in this kind of platforms where very learned people comes and share their knowledges but very deluded persons like me will be also coming in this kind of place and uh, able to exchange our uh, wisdom so anyway uh, this was his prayers that he first give me uh, give it to me so uh, so my life was sort of like that yeah <laughs> so this is my memories with him <laughs> when i was young <laughs> yeah. he was very special in a way you know, he was very old, by the way. He was very old. He cannot walk then uh, half of miles. And then, uh, other than if he has to make more journey, then everyone has to carry him. Like sometimes he will call me and then show on the sky all about this. Probably we call it tiglinga. Tiglinga means, what do you call tiglinga? Yeah, uh, like spheres and rainbows. Yeah, spheres and rainbows. And he might be appearing that way. He might be seeing that one. Well, well, like, how could I see it? He used to show all those things, can you see that? And I rub my eyes and I cannot see like, no, 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 stupid one, and all those things. Are, yeah. So anyway, my memory with my great master was very, I mean, like, it's very, really, really precious still now. Yeah. So. We take uh, one more question, and then we'd like to close with a, a chant. So sorry. Sorry, you, you, you raised one. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, man. Um, my relative purpose is actually where I grow this ultimate purpose of about. I, you know, like biggest lessons that I learned from so far now, or the teachings that I realized, which I have been forgotten a very long time back, is actually teaching to the students. And when this, when we exchange the knowledges, we learn more, probably, you know. And uh, let's say, my my relative purpose is actually to uphold the Dharma, which is the living words of Buddha, which have come from last 2,500 years ago, generations and generations, which is still alive, still fresh, that has given to me by my masters. So I have my, my responsibility or my relative purpose is to give these uh, precious things to the younger generations or other seekers carefully. <laughs>